Tonight we'll be talking about the millennium, the millennium. So this will be an interesting teaching for all of you. So what is the millennium? Millennium simply translates, uh, if you look at the meaning of millennium in the Bible, it basically means 1,000 years, 1,000 years. So that's what millennium is. So will there be a period of 1,000 years? Absolutely. So this is from the doctrine of eschatology. Now, if you look at your notes or in your outline, and those of you online should have the theological studies outline, not tonight's teaching, but the theological studies outline. And just go to our website. Again, I said this over and over again, www.bbcenglish.org. Find theological studies outline, and then from there, it will give you all the things that we're going to go through in our teaching on discipleship. One of them, is, one of the branches of theology we're covering is called eschatology. Eschatology is the doctrine of the end times. So millennium is one of those basic main doctrines that is from eschatology we'll be studying. Okay, so without further ado, let's get going. So let's cover the first point right here regarding Christ at the millennium. Regarding Christ at the millennium. So if the cameraman can see if this is out of the side in both cameras, both cameras. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 25. So concerning about Christ at the millennium, what he'll be doing is that he's going to judge different nationalities. And as he judges different nationalities, he's going to spare or damn them. He's going to either spare or damn them. Now, when does this occur? Mm -hmm. Lower one notch here, like when you face the board, it's like, Ah, okay then. Thank you. So let's lower it one notch. All right. So how am I now? I'm really close to the uh, phone too. So maybe I might. We'll allow you to make this. I'll let you make. All right. Thank you, brother. All right. So uh, this occurs after his second coming. You gotta understand. So this occurs after his second coming. And. After his second coming, it's a judgment. So this judgment is called judgment of nations. Judgment of nations. That's what it's called. So again, this is judging different nationalities around the world. And then he's going to spare or damn them depending on how well they treated the Jews. So that's the determination of the judgment at this judgment of nations. Verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. So you see that? This is after his second coming. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. See that? So he's about to start his millennial reign. But when he starts his millennial reign, this is the judgment of nations. And before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. So notice the determination of this. Look at verse 35. For I was in hunger, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink. I was a stranger, and he took me in. Naked, and he clothed me, and I was sick, and he visited me. I was in prison, and he came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? Uh, so these people who are able to enter, who are spared at the judgment, Jesus told them, because you fed me, you clothed me. You visited me in prison. Now think about that, visiting you in prison. And Jesus said, because you did this to me, you're able to be spared. And then these people are asking him, so when did we do this to you, Jesus? I don't remember doing that. And Jesus answers at verse 40, and the king shall answer and say unto them, verily I say unto you, in as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my what? Brethren. Brethren, ye have done it unto me. So notice right here that the determination is how they treated his brethren. Now, who are his brethren? If you look at every time the Bible says the word bread, uh, not the Bible, the book of Matthew, what the author is thinking, Matthew, when he says brethren, it's referring to Jews. But let, uh, let me just read this verse quickly. You don't have to write this verse down, but if you want to make sure, it would be Matthew chapter 23. And it will be verse 8. But be not ye called rabbi. See, that's Jewish. 
for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren. See? So Jesus, when he's talking about the brethren here, he's talking about his own nation, his own brethren in the flesh, the Jews. So that's what the context is. And you're going to see that every time in the book of Matthew. Now, look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 5. Now, what's important to understand is that since all the world, they will see Jesus in his coming of glory. That's what Matthew 25 said, right? When he comes in his glory, they're obviously going to see him. Thus, no faith is necessary for salvation. Why is that? Because faith is something that is not seen. But see, they're going to see Jesus. That's why faith is not necessary in the millennium. So we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all what? Flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, if you read the whole chapter of Isaiah, you'll see the context is talking about his kingdom on the earth. When he's right there on the earth ruling. And everyone will see him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, what does it say? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See that? That's the reason why people, we say Christianity is a faith, right? Why is that? Because we believe without seeing. It requires faith for you to believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. Why? Because you don't see him. You don't see him shedding that blood to wash away your sins. You accept it by faith. But in the millennium, that's not required. Why is that? Because you're seeing Jesus already. That's why we say that in the millennium, that faith is not necessary for salvation. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. And then we're going to read verses 2 through 4. Verses 2 through 4 of Isaiah chapter 2. Now, what kind of reign will he have? We're not talking about lowly Jesus, meek and mild, born in a stable, being loving and forgiving like he was at his first coming. At his first coming. At his second coming, his rulership is not going to be a democracy. Did you hear what I said? It's not going to be like your United States of America, land of the free, home of the brave. Besides, we're not living in a democracy. It's a joke. But the point is, is that his rule is going to be military dictatorship. Now, you might say, well, then what makes him different from Adolf Hitler? What makes him different from... Mao Zedong. I'll tell you what's different. Those men are selfish in the flesh, pleasing their own lust of the flesh. God, he does it in holiness. He does it in rightness. He does it without sin. Thus, whatever he tells you to do, you better follow. That's how it should be done, right? That's how we can get peace on the earth is if everyone followed what God said. Now look at Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days. See, the era is the future. That the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. See that? Nations flowing into it. That matches Matthew 25. All these nations coming before God. So this is no doubt the millennium. And many people shall go and uh, say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. Oh, here's your praise from United Nations. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 27. I'm going to go ahead and read it. I already wrote it on the board so that some of you can write it down. Those of you who are here, you have the privilege of looking at your notes. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. See, it's a military dictatorship. 
Psalms chapter 2, please. Psalms chapter 2, and we'll read verse 6 through 7. Psalms chapter 2, and we will read verse 6 through 7. Jesus will force everyone on earth to serve and worship him. I ain't going to bow the knee. I ain't going to worship Jesus. Oh, no, you will. You're gonna, he's going to make you bow the knee. In his rule and in his reign, it's a military dictatorship, and you're going to bow whether you like it or not. Everyone has to worship him. All shall bow, as one song says. All shall praise. All shall bow before the King, Jesus Christ, the Ancient of Days. Every knee in earth and heaven shall bow to the throne he has given. At the name of Christ our Redeemer, all shall bow. Amen. All shall bow. It's actually a really good song by uh, Majesty Music, actually. A really good, really good song, actually. Uh, the guy, his name is Ron Hamilton. He founded Patch the Pirate Club. So that's a really good song. But anyway, Psalms chapter 2, verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. See that? So on the earth, the king is ruling. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son this day, have I begotten thee. Verse 11. Serve the Lord with what? Fear. And rejoice with what? Trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be what? Angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Hoo-hoo, I told you so. <laughs> All right, Revelation chapter 20. <laughs> Revelation chapter 20. See, this is military dictatorship, folks. Well, why, why, should, well, why can't he be gracious and merciful? Oh, he already did 2,000 years. He made salvation that easy and simple for you. He made... He allowed you to make fun of his name, joke about him, put a comedy show and make Jesus jokes, and criticize and persecute his own children. I think he's been gracious with you long enough. It's about yeah. time he gets payday. It's about time he gets payment. All right, regarding the wicked. So let now we know about what Christ's role will be like at the millennium. But what is the wicked's role at the millennium? Okay, so if the cameraman can keep an eye out, if I'm out of bounds, right here, if I'm going too low. All right, so regarding the wicked is that Satan will be cast into the bottomless pit of hell throughout the entire time. No lower than that. All right, then. Thank you so much. All right, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 2. Notice, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and cast him and, and bound him. How long? A thousand years. So it shows that during that entire 1,000 years, the millennium, Satan will be at the bottomless pit the entire time. Three and four will also explain it. Another thing concerning the wicked is that uh, the beast and the false prophet, praise the Lord, they will be cast into the lake of fire. They will be cast into the lake of fire. These people who have deceived so many souls in the tribulation... They're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Turn to Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, please. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. And then uh, we're not going to read the whole passage, but all the way down to chapter 20 and verse 4, you can tell that the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire when the millennium starts. Yeah. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. See, they're cast in the lake of fire. 21, 1, 2, 3, and 4 of chapter 20, you'll see during that millennium, they're in the lake of fire. Okay, look at Isaiah chapter 34. Now this one will not be taught in your typical churches, including typical independent fundamental Baptist churches. They won't know this doctrine. Only Bible believers will know this. But what Bible believers teach and believe is that if you're part of the wicked during the millennium, you know what happens? You go to a hell on earth, and that's located near at the land of Edom. So God's going to open up hell on earth. And that will be found at Isaiah chapter 34, verse 2, 6, and 9 through 15. 
And then you're going to also see right here, let me add another point right here, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 23 through 24. All right, now go to those two passages. I'm going to show you something here. So this is after the second advent. Now remember, what's after the second advent, folks? It's the millennium, right? You got the judgment of nations going on, and then you got Satan cast into the bottomless pit. And then you've got uh, people living happily ever after with the kingdom on the earth, etc., etc. So after the second advent, thus, this will be the timing of the millennium. So we know this will be referring during the context of the millennium. Because in this second advent, you'll notice right here, the Lord will create a hell on earth. And that is filled with demons, devils at the land of Edom. We're going to look at verse 2. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath uh, delivered them to the slaughter. So remember, God wiped out all the armies on the earth at the second coming, right? Now, what happens then is verse 6. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in where? Basra. And a great slaughter in the land of where? Idumea. Okay, this is near the Edom. Now let's uh, read verse 9. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into what? Brimstone. And the land thereof shall become what? Burning pitch. But this is hell we're talking about, because look at verse 10. It shall not be quenched night nor day, the smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. That's hell, this kind of fire. Uh, let's keep reading right here. Verse uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Do you see a bunch of weird-looking creatures, demonic creatures mentioned in those verses? You notice that? How about that? See, it's going to be filled with devils. Another thing is... Let's look at Isaiah chapter 66 now. Now, you know why the Lord's going to open that up on the earth? I'll tell you why. It's so that it can put the fear of God upon people when they are forced to worship Jesus on the earth. And they're like, no, uh, I'm a proud atheist. No, I'm going to take my chances. You know how many people I've talked to that some of them actually have the audacity to say, yeah, I can take hell. It's not a problem with me. I mean, I, I can say God a thing or two. My friend, you're not going to do that, okay? He's going to make everyone see this. And everyone will see this hell on earth. And when everyone sees this, trust me, you're not going to tell God a thing or two after that. <laughs> yeah, amen. Look at verse 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me. See that? They're going to worship him. But they're going to look at the same time, Verse 24, and they shall go forth and look upon the what? Carcasses of the men. Remember Isaiah 32? He hath the slaughter of all these men. But the slaughter of these men has hell fire. Because keep reading. Carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die. Neither shall their fire be quenched. That's hell. See, I told you so. Everyone's going to see it. Now, what church taught you that doctrine before? Huh? What church taught you that before? All right, now let's talk about Israel at the millennium, regarding Israel at the millennium. Now, I know you Christians want to think that it's all about you at the millennium, but no, that's not true. God is not done with the nation of Israel. He has a role and a purpose for them that is separate and different from you. Look at Joel chapter 3, please. Joel chapter 3. And then Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8. When God comes down on the earth, the exact location, his capital is going to be Washington, D.C. Nope. His capital is going to be Rome, the Vatican Empire. No, it's not. That, yeah. Augustine, you got it wrong. That's not the, where Jerusalem is going to be. It's going to be Independence City, Missouri. Some of you are like going, what is that? Mormons teach that. Mormons teach wow. that. Joey Smith thought that was the case. Good old pervert Joey, you know. 
All right. Why did you say pervert Joey, Pastor? Well, just read his life story. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right, Joel chapter 3, and then uh, we'll read verse 16. We'll read verse 16. Notice what the Bible says is that when he comes down on the earth, the exact location is Zion, Jerusalem. The Lord also shall roar out of where? Zion. And utter his voice from where? Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of who? Israel. Israel. So shall he know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in where? Zion. My holy mountain, then shall Jerusalem be holy. Now look at Zechariah 8 and verse 3. Your hand should already be there, so I'm going to read it ahead. Zechariah chapter 8 verse 3 reads, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountains of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. See, his headquarters is Jerusalem. Look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 26. Romans chapter 11, verse 26. If you insist that it's only going to be Christians who will take Jerusalem for themselves, and this has nothing to do with... With the nation, and I mean nation, I'm not talking about Christian Jews, I'm talking about the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel, their salvation, their operation, God dealing with them is different from how he deals with Christians. The nation of Israel, what's going to happen to them is that their sins will be nationally cleansed away. So this salvation, this sinful cleansing is obviously different from Christians. If you insist that, no, this is re- these Jews are referring to Christians, then I would like to ask you this question. Then why is it, is it talking about a national cleansing in the future? Shouldn't you be cleansed right now by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is God going to withhold his cleansing from you? Oh, God, I want to get saved. Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to withhold my cleansing until the future. You got, you got a long way to go, child. You got to wait a little longer. No, that's not how it works. That's why it makes sense that this future cleansing yeah. has to be a different group of people, not saved Christians today. This is referring to a nation cleansing. Because remember, the nation of Israel right now is wicked. Mm. Nation of Israel reject Jesus Christ. Right. But once they enter the millennium and they see Jesus on the earth, then what do you think they're going to do after that? This is the Messiah the Old Testament prophets talked about. They're going to repent. They're going to get right with God. Look at right here, Romans chapter 11, verse 26. And so notice, what does it say? All All Israel. Israel. So this is a nation. This is a nation. Shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, And shall what? Turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I what? Shall take away their sins. See that? Now verse 28 should convince you these Jews are not Christians. Okay? See? That national salvation is totally different from verse 28. Your salvation. The gospel you're saved. Mm -hmm. These are lost sinners. Jews. Okay, let's also look at Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. What's really hilarious is that there are some of these arrogant trolls on the internet who like to call themselves brand new, independent, fundamental, Baptist, KJV only people, and they try to deceive people that they're the real Baptist. Some of these uh, weirdos and heretics They would like to say that they're the real Jews. Okay, if you are, then I would like to ask you, what tribe you're from, huh? You're from Judah? You're from Benjamin? Which tribe are you? Because God's restoring the tribes here. Look at Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his root. See that capitalization? Out of Israel, David's line, there's going to be Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading right here. Uh, Verse 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. That sounds undoubtedly like millennium to you, right? Similar wordings you read before. Now let's keep reading here. Uh, Verse 12. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the who? 
outcasts of Israel. Are you an outcast? Are you safe Christians outcast? No, we're part of the family of God. So this is referring to Israel who was casted away before by God. But now God's restoring them. Keep reading. And gather together the dispersed of who? Judah. From the four corners of the earth, the envy also of who? Ephraim shall depart. And the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah. And Judah shall not vex Ephraim. You see that? These tribes. The tribes of Israel will be restored. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. Uh, we won't turn there for time's sake. No, actually, you know what? We'll turn there because some people might not believe this part. So let's look at this one, all right? Some of you might not believe what I'm going to say. So let's go to this part. Ezekiel chapter 36. Yes, sir. Ezekiel chapter 36. So the tribes are restored. And we saw that Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 1, 4, and 12 to 13. Now, the next thing right here is that Israel will become like the Garden of Eden. And here's another thing right here. Their families, they're going to have families that will grow even more and more. Wait, you're saying that there's going to be marriage? There's going to be birth of children? Absolutely. At the millennium, there will be. But I thought that Jesus said that marriages are not given in heaven. Yeah, you know why? Very simple. That's why you have to divide Israel from, say, Christians. You have to divide that. Because we're already married to Jesus Christ. We have our marriage supper of the Lamb. So I'm going to explain that a little later. So we're already taken. But these Jews right here, they're going to keep making families and they're going to grow. And then some of these internet weirdos who like to boast themselves as new independent fundamental Baptists profess that Christians will go through the tribulation and attack the nation of Israel. These numbskulls say that this teaching is a fantasy that, family, uh, that you were going to have children at the millennium. Ezekiel. No, they don't read their Bible. No, you're going to have families. Families are actually going to grow. So you're going to repopulate throughout this whole era. All right, let's look what the Bible says. Hey, don't don't believe me, all right? Don't, don't look at me like a tree full of owls and say, what, what? Look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. Don't go, hoo hoo and go with big eyes like an owl looking at me. Look at, look, look, look at the Bible. People are just so glued on a screen and they're like, uh-uh, uh-uh, what? He's crazy, uh-uh. Look down at your Bible. Do you have your Bible open? Do you have your Bible open? Look at it, look at it. I could be a cult leader here right now and everything that I taught you was just a made-up lie. Okay. Oh, you're scaring me, Pastor. What if you're a deceiver? Good. Praise the Lord. Look at the verse, okay? All right. Notice what the Bible says. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities. Oh, see that? You don't like that, do you? There's no doubt. This is strongly nation of Israel uh, millennium. Now, let's keep reading right here. I will also cause you to what? Dwell in the cities, and the way shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by, and they shall see this land that was desolate is become like what? The Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they finally have what they wanted. They're back at the garden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will what? Increase them with men like a flock. See, I told you, they're numbering more people. Verse 38, as the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feast, so shall the waste cities be what? Filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. See, they're going to give birth to children. They're going to repopulate. All right, let's look at Micah chapter 4. Well, we won't turn there for time's sake, but in Micah chapter 4, another thing to note concerning the nation of Israel is that God will reinstate the Jewish laws and practices. So the easy, so this is the easiest proof of dispensationalism. 
People who deny dispensationalism, they think it's just Old and New Testament. That's it. No, you got to put more differences than just Old Testament. All of a sudden, it changed with Christianity, and we live forever, yada, yada, yada. No, that's not how it works, okay? you got to realize that God's going to reinstate Old Testament practices at the millennium. Then what are you going to do? You don't have an answer to that, do you? Okay, look at Micah chapter 4, verse 1 through 2. Jewish laws and practices reinstated. All right, let me know if I'm out of bounds on the side on both cameras. Okay, Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Verses 1 through 2. Notice that Jewish laws and ordinances are going to be reinstated. So I would like to ask you a very simple question. If you don't think that the nation of Israel is a separate nation then uh, who's going to be observing Jewish practices? You think it's going to be dummy Christians? Come on, use your head. Exactly. It's not Christians. So then who else is it going to be? You have to argue there's going to be a nation of Israel restored. You can't say we Christians are the ones. No, that if you want to do that, then you might as well do the Jewish laws and ordinances. See, they're not using their head. Micah uh, chapter 4, verse 1 through 2. I said we won't turn there, and I just turned there. Okay, but in the last days it shall come to pass. See, later on the future. Mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted. Verse 2, many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of who? Jacob. And he will teach us of whose ways? His ways, and we will walk in his path for the what? Law shall go forth of Zion. See that? And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. All right, regarding creation at the millennium. So now let's talk about his creation. Okay, so you can write these verses down. We're not going to turn there for time's sake. But regarding the creation at the millennium, what's going to happen is that all creatures are going to enjoy each other's company when Jesus comes down on the earth. So creatures are in harmony with together so imagine man ain't it a blessing that you see a tiger and a sh and a lamb hugging each other cuddling against each other wow what 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 a paradise man what a paradise amen so imagine that a child having a lion as his kitten yeah to play with Let's go. isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 verse 4 so we know the context is millennium because we looked at those verses before, right? Right here. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, verse 6 through 8 talks about the creatures in harmony together. Uh, another thing concerning uh, the creation at the millennium is that the earth and the inhabitants, they're going to have no dis deficiencies. There are no deficiencies. And that's found at Isaiah chapter... 35, verse 1 through 7. So earth and the hat, inhabitants, no deficiencies. Save the environment, save the environments. Well, you're just wasting your money. All those millions of dollars, you're just wasting your money. You're not going to have, you're not going to have it until Jesus Christ comes down on the earth, okay? Okay, another thing right here is longevity restored. Longevity restored. That's found at Isaiah chapter 65, verse 20, and then 25. As a matter of fact, it says that a person who's not that good at the millennium will die at the age of 100. So then imagine a person who lives right, how much longer he has left to live. All right, now go to Jeremiah 30, just in case some people still doubt me on this one. Family life continues. See, they're repopulating here. Family life continues when the Lord restores Israel at the millennium. So if you guys doubt me, then turn to Jeremiah chapter 30. And we're going to read verse 18 through 20. Verses 18 through 20. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 18 to 20. I would also like to ask this question. If you really think that Christians are going to go through the tribulation and they're the ones who are going to take it, the land of Israel, and this is not referring to Jews, then I would like to ask you this question. 
You really think you're going to go through the tribulation then, and you're going to continue your family life? It's talking about you? So say Christians are going to marry each other and continue family life. Isn't that a Mormon teaching then? Where the saints, they're going to marry wives over there and repopulate with children? It's really hilarious that these uh, internet weirdos who call themselves brand new independent fundamental Baptist KJV only stuff like that, that they accuse us of teaching Mormonism because we believe in uh, repopulation. But there are verses that clearly show it. So, yeah, we believe in repopulation, but it's not for us. This is referring to the nation of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. So if you insist that, no, it's not referring to the nation of Israel, it's Christians, then you got, you're in trouble because you're teaching the Mormon teaching then that this family life then has to be Christians repopulating the world. Don't look at me like a tree full of owls again. Look at your Bible, man. People just get mad, and then they, they we start, to, people start stopping. People just start to all of a sudden stop watching the video, and then we drop on live stream. And am I putting some of you under conviction? We have some people unsubscribing at this moment because they're very sensitive because it goes against their bias, their own preconceived belief, rather than looking at what the Bible says. Look at Jeremiah, chapter 30, verse 18. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents, and have mercy on his dwelling places, and the city shall be builded upon her own heap, and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof, and out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of them that make merry. And I will what? Multiply them, and they shall not be what? You. See, they're going to repopulate. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. They're what? Children. Children. Okay, you get the point? Also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. What are you going to do then? Huh? What are you going to do? By the way, what are you going to do with Isaiah 11 right here? That a little child shall lead a lion. Who do you think that child is? You think some Christian who uh, just got saved, that he's going to be a child for all eternity? Who's that referring to? There is no doubt ordinary human life, population growth, is going to resume in the millennium. And that can't be saved Christian. Those are a different group of people. You can't deny that. Okay. Nature will also become lively. Now, this is something else. Where you see these fantasy movies, they're trying to... Uh, bring up this fact that you can talk to trees <clears throat> and then rocks and stuff like that. I'm going to tell you something that they're just grabbing stuff from the Bible. The Bible says nature will become lively in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 12 to 13. Now, I don't know how much life will be in nature, so I'm not saying they're going to be altogether a different person, but it's going to you're going to be surprised how much life and how much animation that they have within themselves, nature. The Bible says the trees shall clap their hands with joy. Okay, regarding the church. So what's our role, right, the Christians? What's the role of Christians at the millennium? The role of Christians at the millennium. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 11. You can turn over there, Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 yeah. through 11. <clears throat> yes, sir? Did... Nothing? Oh, oh, okay. No, All right. Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Yeah, Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Amen. What happens is, is that we're going to have the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. That's found in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 through 11. I'm not going to read it for time's sake, so you go ahead and glance through that. So notice that Christians are up in heaven at the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, and it's actually going to resume... And once this marriage supper occurs, we're going to have the second advent as well. You'll notice from verse 7 through 11, it's marriage supper and second advent. We come down with Jesus to conquer the earth. Yeah. All right. That's something. So imagine we have our, so what's going on is that we, we have our wedding and then we have our wedding supper. And then we go down to our honeymoon down, not on a Mustang, but on unicorns, maybe going down. And then here we are, the bride and the groom going down. And then a red carpet is rolled out for us as we go against all the armies. And it's going to be red with blood like a red carpet. And then he's going to set on the earth 
And that's where we're going to enjoy a very long honeymoon. How about that, man? Okay, so there are people who reign with Christ a thousand years. That's found at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. So we can see that this is not just tribulation saints or Jews. This is referring to Christians as well. Because you compare that with Romans chapter 8 verse 17 as well as 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. It talks about Christians ruling, Christians reigning. So then, the saints will rule on the earth. Aren't Christians counted as the saints? Yes. So thus, we will rule on the earth. So when the Bible says saints, we can think of many different groups of people. Old Testament saints, tribulation saints, Jewish saints, including Christian saints. So we're going to be ruling. So that's going to be a blessing. We're going to rule the world, man. You're going to take back the, uh, the, what the elites always wanted. They sought it from the Antichrist at the tribulation. They never got it. And it belongs to us, the kingdom that the elites always wanted. The new world order, the ones that they get, sold their souls to the devil to. Hey, they sold their souls to the wrong person. We sold our souls to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, because of that, his kingdom will reign supreme and not this new world order junk. Now, how much you reign depends on how much your service is. That is extremely important. How well you serve in is going to depend on how much you rule. These are found at Luke chapter 19, verse 17, as well as 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. It says, you suffer, you reign with him. And then not only that, it also shows that a Christian can face the loss of his reign. Because think about it, at Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, which is, so let me move over here at the side. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, it shows that there are saved people who wipes away tears from their eyes. So thus, it shows that Christians can still feel the grief and loss during the millennium. So think about it. 1,000 years is a long time compared to your lifetime. What are you wasting your time on on this life? You think you want to run away from the sorrows of this life? What about during 1,000 years of the millennium? See, that's a long time. That's why you got to get your tails into serving God and not waste time in them. Now... Uh, we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 33, and then we'll read verse 14. Isaiah chapter 33, and then we'll read verse 14. All right, let's talk about the world. What's going to happen to the world at the millennium? Oh, boy, this is stuck. Okay, there we go. So Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 14 through 17. Now, I'm not going to read that for time's sake. But now let's talk about the world at the millennium. Notice that one in Isaiah chapter 33, when you read that verse, I mean, don't believe a word that I'm saying. Just read it right now while I'm erasing the board. Verse 14 through 17, at the presence of God. So when will God be present on the earth? The millennium. See? So this is millennium. So when God is present on the earth, God is present before them, a person survives hell by strictly obeying the commandments. See, so salvation in the millennium is very, very different from salvation from saved Christians today. Now remember, faith is not necessary at the millennium. Remember that? So we already got a difference right there. Because we are already seeing Jesus. But what's required at the millennium is strictly obeying his commandments. That's how you get saved. You might say, no, I don't believe that. What do you mean you don't believe that? Remember, God has to make everything perfect at the millennium. Isn't it logical to think that if he's going to do a military dictatorship, lays out the rules, that if you're going to survive, you have to follow the rules? Remember, the verse says he's going to cast you into hell fire if you don't follow along his system, right? See, that shows right there that there is undoubtedly a difference of salvation at the millennium. So, uh, that is point number six, regarding the world at the millennium. Regarding the world at the millennium, one, salvation by strictly keeping the commandments. So, it's works. 
at the millennium. This is found in Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 14 through 17. Read your Bible. People just don't read their Bible. They scream heresy, heresy without even reading the Bible. People who scream heresy without even reading the Bible are a heretic themselves, I tell you. All right, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, 4, and 9. The world will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. So everyone's going to know the truth. So here you are still growing and searching for knowledge of the truth. But at the millennium, you're all going to be filled automatically because God is right there. The way, the truth, and the life is already right there. That's Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, 4, and 9. You know who are going to be the people online that are going to say the government is a conspiracy? It's going to be the liberals now at the millennium. It's going to be the false cults at the millennium. They're going to be the ones posting things at YouTube on a dark web during the millennium and saying, see, Jesus Christ, he's a, there's a conspiracy behind him. You see that? He's actually the devil. Jesus is not real. That's what's going to happen at the millennium. They're all going to have conspiracies behind the scenes. They're going to put up the videos and the images and the photos. Those guys who once accused Bible believers of being conspiracy theorists that they themselves are going to be the ones themselves. They're going to be doing that at the millennium because it, Satan's going to gather a whole bunch of people at the millennium. So it shows that during this whole time at the millennium, there are people behind the scenes, conspiracies. Isn't that funny? Isn't that really funny? What they accuse us of something, they themselves are guilty of. <laughs> Hypocrisy, amen? All right. Uh, another thing right here is that... Uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, 16 through 21, the verse says that at God's reign on earth, a person has to offer sacrifices. Now, see that? This can't be saved, Christians. You got you to gotta admit there's got to be a separate dealing of Jews. And they're going to be keep the, keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, this teaching tonight, whether you like it or not, undoubtedly proves dispensationalism and the restoration of the nation of Israel. Yes. If you deny dispensationalism, teach Christians, go through the tribulation, and that Christians are the replacement of the Jews, you don't even know a basic doctrine of eschatology, the millennium. That should be troubling. Who's going to offer sacrifices then? You think it's going to be a Christian? No, it's going to be a Jew. The reason why they have to offer sacrifices and keep the Feast of Tabernacles is because if they don't do that, God's going to send a plague and a lack of rainfall in that particular area who's not following his orders. I mean, look at the verse. Don't believe me. Don't believe me. Look at the verse. All right, because God's capital is in Jerusalem, the world will recognize Israel as a superior nation. It is going to be a superior nation. I don't believe in that. That is racism. You know, saying that this nation is above all other nations. Here's the point, okay? You know why you say racism and then you say that that's uh, totally incorrect? Very simple. Because you want every nation to be equal with their own belief, culture, and ideology. Here's the thing. It, I'm, I'm not, uh, you're a Jew lover, you're a Jew lover. What if God chose Africa, huh? You know what you guys are going to do? You're a bunch of African lovers. You're a bunch of black lovers. If I chose Korea, God forbid that I would do that. As much as I would like to do that. But if I start doing that, you're going to say, oh, he's a racist. He's a, a Korean supremacist. If I said America, you're all going to say he's a white supremacist. Now, look at that. See, it doesn't matter. The point is, if God chose a particular religion, the world will call that intolerance and discrimination. If God chose a nation, the world will call that intolerance and discrimination. You know what your problem is? Your problem is, whenever God chooses something, you don't like it. You want to be just as special. That's your problem, folks. You see why they're against Christianity? Because we claim that our salvation, see, 
Whether you like it or not, our salvation is superior than all other religions on what they teach on salvation. I don't care if you like that or not. Lump it. It's, what, it's not a matter of Baptist being superior or Israel being superior. That's not the point. The point is what God chose is superior. Yeah, That's the point. All right, we're going to look at, well, we're not going to look. Now, regarding the millennium, let's close it off right here, and then we'll call it a night. Let's close it off right here, and then we'll call it a night. Now, let's talk about after the millennium, after the millennium. So what's going to happen after the millennium, folks? Hmm, I wonder. Once the millennium is over, Satan is going to be freed. That's what's going to happen. Satan will be freed, and then here are all those uh, liberals and Catholics and Masons and God knows who else, communists, Muslims, etc., who are all hiding on the dark web of the internet, sharing Facebook blogs and YouTube videos of Jesus is a conspiracy. I told you Jesus is the Antichrist, see? And I told you that uh, he is actually, a, uh, you know, these uh, Christians are actually Nephilim and reptilians, those guys. You see Pastor Kim living in Hollywood now in Beverly Hills with his own mansion at the millennium. See, I told you he's part of the conspiracy. He's the real elite. That's what's going to happen. And Satan will be the Alex Jones of that day who will gather everybody together. And all of them are going to flock up with signs and saying, you know, if Jesus comes down at 9-11... And they're at Armageddon. 9-11, see? I told you it's a conspiracy, all these liberals will say. And all these uh, Catholics, Muslims, communists, and law sinners. Uh, hey, just sympath I'm just enjoying myself, all right? That's what the liberals always make fun of us, right? That's what the world always pokes fun at us, right? I'm just enjoying myself because that's what they're going to be doing one day, too. <laughs> oh, man. And then Satan, he's going to gather them up together, and then he's going to have them oppose God again. And that proves this is a very important thing. This is very important to understand. This undoubtedly proves that even if you have a perfect environment like Adam and Eve, zero sin, zero suffering, you'll still come out like an atheist. You'll still come out like a lost sinner, a liberal. You'll still come out like a person who will reject God Almighty, even if you have everything perfect. See, they're filled with knowledge. They had got all the answers, but they want to deny it. This is a very important point that I use against atheists when they talk about, well, if there is a God of love, why is there suffering? And I'd say, even if he had zero suffering, you wouldn't believe there is a God. You can't blame Adam and Eve. Why? Because you're going to be like Adam and Eve one day, and then you'll still rebel against God. All right, what's going to happen? All of creation will burn up after the millennium. So once Satan frees and all these people start to pick out their signs and professing equal right down with the Jewish dictator, what a racist that he would choose Jerusalem. Well, what about America? What about Korea? What about Africa? What about China? Blah, 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 blah. And then while these people just scream out freedom of speech, freedom of speech, then what God's going to do is he's going to send down fire from heaven and burn all them up. Oh, did that make you feel uncomfortable? Did that make you feel uncomfortable just now? Pastor, you're on a roll. That's right, I am on a roll. You know why? I am extremely angry at this hypocrisy where, they're, where, where they cry out freedom of speech and they limit your freedom of speech, That's right. you Bible believers. I'm sick and tired of these guys talking about equality, equal rights and stuff like that. Basically, they want their own selfish desire approved. This is wickedness. So God's going to burn up everything, heaven and earth, after the millennium. Then what's going to happen is that Satan and then all his folks that join on his side will be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. So they go to the lake of fire for all eternity. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 10 through 15, and then finally, let's close it right here. The saints will live happily ever after. Finally, no more tear, no more sorrow. 1,000 years is over. Saints will live happily ever after at Revelation chapter 21. They will be happy in 
So 21 verses 1 through 4. A new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. There's your doctrine of the millennium. Now, listening to this teaching tonight, I just can't wait for God to come back and rapture us right now. Yeah, Let's begin, all right? Heavenly Father, I pray that you will bless the next Bible study we're about to have. Uh, dismiss the discipleship with your blessing. I pray it's been a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.